Hello, this is Dr. Grant Cooper at Princeton Spine and Joint Center. In today's video, I wanted to respond to a question that I received the other day. So this question reads, I am 55 years old and I was diagnosed with a disc herniation causing my back pain. I have had the pain for almost six months. My doctor said I should have an epidural steroid injection for my pain. Do epidurals work? Okay, this is a great question and it brings up a lot of interesting points for us to discuss. There's an easy, quick answer, but that loses all its context. And I'm going to assume that you want the full, no holds barred explanation so that you can see it from all its different angles. Yes? Good. Let's see if we can unpack this together. So first, what is an epidural steroid injection in the first place? Well, epi is the Latin prefix for on or upon. And the dura is the lining of the spinal cord and nerve root. So an epidural injection is any injection upon the dura or right outside of the dura. An epidural that is given for pregnancy is going to be very different than an epidural that is given for the treatment of pain. When an epidural steroid injection is used for a patient with lumbar or lumbosacral problems, first of all, the medication being injected is a steroid. And we'll return to that in a moment. But first, when it comes to the epidural itself, there are three basic ways that the epidural steroid injection can be performed. The first and the most common in the 21st century is what we would call a transforaminal epidural steroid injection. Now, the word transforaminal describes the approach that this type of epidural steroid injection takes. So here's our lower back. In this approach, the needle, indicated by my pen, comes in from the side and is placed at the foramen and the medication then goes across the foramen, hence trans, right, across, transforaminal. The advantage to performing a transforaminal epidural steroid injection is that you can place the medication directly next to the nerve root that you think is causing the pain, right? You're right next to the nerve root. The second most common approach for an epidural steroid injection is called an interlaminar epidural steroid injection. Inter means between, and so an interlaminar epidural uh, is one in which a needle is introduced from the back of the spine between the lamina. And as you move the needle between the lamina, you're going to pop through a big ligament there called the uh, ligamentum flavum, which is running along the back of the spine. And then the medication, you pop through this ligament, and the medication is going to be delivered into the epidural space. Now, there are two major disadvantages to this approach. First, the problem that's being targeted is in the anterior aspect of the canal, or in other words, the front of the fecal sac and closer to the disc. And in the interlaminar approach, that spread is going to start posterior, right? Your needle's here, but you want to get over here. And generally, that's not going to be as good as if you target it from a transforaminal approach in terms of getting the medication there. Now, additionally, the medication is often diluted as it as it does travel to the front of the spine. Now, an advantage of the interlaminar approach is that you're going to get more medication spread. And so if you're targeting multiple areas, then this may be a reason to consider an interlaminar epidural steroid injection. So for example, uh, in patients with diffuse stenosis, where the pain is coming from multiple levels, an interlaminar may be a good approach to try. In general, the consensus opinion, and certainly the approach that my colleagues and I will take, is to favor the transforaminal approach. And then if that doesn't work, and there's a reason to think uh, that the lack of efficacy might have been due to the stenosis itself blocking the flow of the medication, then an interlaminar may be something to consider in that instance. An interlaminar may also be something to consider in an older person with multi-level stenosis, like we mentioned, where the symptoms are thought to be coming from multiple nerve root levels and you don't want to have to start targeting them one at a time. You could try an interlaminar. Now, like we said, the interlaminar will have a great spread of the medication to the multiple le levels, but of course this positive is also its negative. By having a greater spread, you also have a more dilute spread, which is why the transforaminal epidural steroid injection is going to be typically favored because you're going to get that more concentrated dosage of the medication uh, at the site of inflammation. Okay, and finally, there's a third approach called a caudal epidural steroid injection. Uh, it's called caudal because the needle is introduced via the tailbone, 
down here, uh, or caudal area through an opening in the sacral bone called the sacral hiatus. And so your needle comes all the way down here and you're gonna be pushing the medication up. Now the disadvantage of a caudal approach is that you're the furthest away from the site you're trying to treat. You can snake a catheter up through the caudal approach and that can make it a more targeted sort of injection. <clears throat> Excuse me, in general though, a caudal is typically used when there's like a large fusion mass after a surgery that's hard to negotiate via transferaminal. Uh, but generally you can manage the most unwieldy fusion masses with a transferaminal approach if you have enough practice and patience. Uh, but we can leave that conversation for another, uh, another video, another talk that goes even further into the technical weeds between these things. But that's basically, th those are the three ways an epidural is done. Now the steroid in the epidural steroid injection is the medication. And steroids are strong anti-inflammatory medications. And the purpose of an epidural steroid injection is to deliver that steroid directly to the site of inflammation. So back to the question we started with. Do epidurals work for back pain and herniated discs? Well, epidural steroid injections are generally used for two basic types of pathologies in the back. First, they're used for radicular or sciatic-like pain. Basically, when there's irritation of a nerve root and the pain from that is being referred or radiating into the buttock and or leg. Now, the other type of pain that epidural steroid injections are used for is discogenic back pain. Remember that herniated discs don't cause back pain per se, but rather back pain occurs from discs when there's a tear on the inside of the disc called an annular tear. Now, when that annular tear extends through the disc, then a transferaminal epidural steroid injection uh, can bathe that tear really nicely and help to neutralize the inflammation. Epidural steroid injections are one of the more interesting um, and at times uh, surprisingly contentious topics in non-surgical spine care. I think it'll be interesting to talk about that a bit, so let me unpack that. So first, epidural steroid injections are performed to remove the inflammation that's causing someone's pain. They're actually really good at doing that. What they don't do is they don't change the biomechanics that led to that inflammation in the first place. So if there was arthritis that was causing a pinched nerve to become inflamed, after the epidural steroid injection takes away the inflammation, there'll still be that arthritis afterwards, right? There just won't be pain. So it's really important to recognize that if all that people do are epidural steroid injections, there's a good chance the inflammation and the pain will get better or go away completely, but, and this is a very important but, the biomechanics will remain unchanged. So therefore, when epidural steroid injections are performed, it's really important to think of them as more windows of opportunity that then allow people the opportunity to work on their biomechanics by doing the right sorts of exercises to tweak the mechanics so that in three months, six months, one year, two years, the pain isn't just coming back. Interestingly, to this point, when prospective studies have looked at the efficacy of epidural steroid injections, they find excellent multi-year results. That is, when they take a bunch of patients that have disc herniations and spinal stenosis, and when those patients are then undergoing a full complement of care to include transferaminal epidural steroid injections, they find that those patients tend to do great when followed out over time. So then you've had a few studies that have tried to randomize and then isolate the epidural. Now these randomized controlled trials are generally a better type of study because they remove all the noise of all the other variables and say, okay, what happens when we just do this injection? What's the effect of just this injection? And it turns out that when you do that, patients only receive several months of relief. So what's going on there? Why are patients doing so much better when they're followed in a real clinical practice, but while they're still doing good, they're not doing as good when they're randomized into a clinical trial on epidurals. Well, when the patients are randomized into a clinical trial, in order to isolate the variable of the injection, patients that receive the injection aren't also given the full complement of therapeutic exercises as they would be if they were just being treated in a clinical practice. So here we can emphasize the importance of addressing the inflammatory cause of pain with an epidural, but then also realizing we have to address the mechanical aspect that led to the inflammation with therapeutic exercises. Right? If you just do an epidural steroid injection and you don't add the exercises into the mix, you may still get a few months or even a year 
or more of relief, but you'll be missing the opportunity to fully address the problem and also to help bulletproof your back against a recurrence of the pain. And this is where some of that uh, miscommunication uh, sometimes come in or, or uh, debate, I think, yeah, sometimes comes in with the epidurals. And it's important to understand what they do, what they don't do, and how best to use them in clinical practice. I hope I've answered your question with this video, and I hope that everyone else has uh, enjoyed this video as well and learned something. If you have, uh, please remember to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and let a friend know to do the same. Uh, if you have any questions that you would like for me to answer in a future video, if you have any comments for me, you can reach me at Dr. Cooper at PrincetonSJC.com or feel free to leave a question or a comment in the comment section. Thank you very much.